Hey everyone, it's Nolan, and in this video I'll be doing a overview of the Eureka 1 plumbing system. So Eureka 1 is our first liquid rocket here at Space Enterprise at Berkeley, and I'll basically be building up the plumbing piece by piece so that you can better understand how the rocket works overall. Okay, so first things first, a little bit of background. So essentially the thrust force that propels a rocket upward is the reaction to the force of hot gases being expelled out of the bottom of the rocket at extremely high velocities. So this is your classic Newton's third law example, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, in this case, the thrust force. So the hot gases leaving the nozzle are actually the byproducts of a combustion reaction occurring in the combustion chamber around this section. And so this reaction occurs when a fuel and oxidizer are pumped through the injector into the combustion chamber and formed into a very fine mist that is then ignited with an external source of energy. So in this video, we'll be focusing on the journey of the fuel and oxidizer to the combustion chamber. So that's everything in this dotted section, everything you don't see here. Um, another way of saying this is we'll be focusing on everything upstream of the injector and the combustion chamber and everything downstream in the nozzle and the chamber will be the topic of another video. Going back to our rocket, here you'll see Eureka 1 in its most fundamental form. So it's really not too complicated. At the very bottom is the final destination of the propellants. So this is the injector with the combustion chamber followed by the nozzle at the very bottom. Going upstream, you'll see three tanks. Two of these tanks are the propellant tanks. The first is the fuel tank, which in our case we use propane. The second is the oxidizer tank, which in our case is liquid oxygen, otherwise known as LOX. And LOX is actually a very commonly used oxidizer in liquid rocketry. At the very top is a smaller tank called the pressurant tank, which we fill with gaseous nitrogen. Keep in mind that Eureka 1 is a pressure-fed liquid rocket. So what this means is that the propellants are fed into the injector by a high-pressure gas at the top, which is what you see here. In other words, the role of the pressurant tank is to push down on both propellants so that they make their way to the bottom and mix at the injector. And you can see that if you follow these lines. Starting at the pressure and tank, it splits off, goes into both propellant tanks, where it pushes down on the contents, and the liquids come out of the bottom, make their way to the bottom of the system, and mix at the injector. What you'll notice is that along these lines are a few of these ball valves. Ball valves are an essential component in liquid rocketry and just plumbing in general. And before I go any further, I'll explain what a ball valve is and how it works. So simply put, a ball valve allows flow when it's open and restricts the flow when it's closed. And this gift does a really good job of showing how that works and why it's called a ball valve. So you can see when the handle is open, the flow is allowed to go through. And then when it's closed, the closed part of the ball is interfacing with the water, restricting the flow. Pretty magical, right? Not really. So this is a picture of a typical ball valve, at least the ones we use. Um, you can see the handle, the ball is contained within this metal, and on both sides you can connect different fittings um, to adapt to whatever is downstream or upstream of the ball valve. And so here's a picture of a random assembly. So you've probably seen ball valves before on things like this. I don't, I don't really know what this thing does, but uh, I've seen things like this. And if you keep an eye out, you'll notice that a lot of them have ball valves on them. So can you spot the ball valves on this assembly? If you said those two, then you are right. Good job. So another important thing to keep in mind is that fluids th flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And you can see in this GIF that at the beginning, the particles are clustered together in a state of high pressure and then flow to areas of low pressure where there are less particles. Um, this is the process of diffusion. And so just the general concept of flow from high pressure to low pressure is an important thing to keep in mind for liquid rocketry. So let's go back to our system. So on Eureka 1, the three most important ball valves are the pressure and valve and the two propellant main valves, otherwise known as just the main valves. When the pressure and valve is opened, the tops of both, both propellant tanks are exposed to the high pressure gas of the pressure and tank. Similarly, when the main valves are opened, the bottoms of both propellant tanks are exposed to the relatively low pressure of the atmosphere. 
So when all three valves are open, there's a complete path for the fluids to flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure out of the bottom of the system. And that's essentially what we do to start a burn or a flow. Eventually, all of the propellant fluids exit out of the bottom through the injector and the pressure and tank is emptied in the same way, leaving all three tanks at the same pressure as the atmosphere around it. Try to convince yourself what would happen in the following situations. You keep the pressure and valve closed, but the main valves are opened, and you keep the main valves closed, but the pressure and valve is opened. A final thing to note is that we can't actually open these valves manually. It's dangerous to be around the system when it's pressurized and the system is also in an airframe. So for many reasons, we need to actually open these valves with remote systems. And so that's the purpose of these pneumatic pistons at the bottom, which push the main valves open um, via a system that we won't discuss too much right now. And the pressure and valve is opened electronically with a motor that is not portrayed in this diagram. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. To sustain a full burn, the pressure and tank is typically pressurized to around 4,000 PSI. For reference, car tires are pressurized to about 30 PSI. So you can imagine the potential energy stored inside of this tank. In comparison, for an optimal burn, the propellant tanks need to be pressurized to around 600 PSI. In addition, they're only rated for 950 PSI. So with a reasonable margin of safety, we cannot pressurize these tanks past around 750 PSI. The issue with this setup, which forms a direct connection between the pressure and tank and the propellant tanks, is that when we open the pressure and ball valve, the propellant tanks would get instantly overpressurized to pressures over 950 PSI and a little bit lower than 4000 PSI because it's a larger volume with the same amount of gas. In addition, even if these tanks could sustain such high pressures, it would result in too quick of a burn that would reach much lower altitudes than the optimal operating pressures. So what do we do about this? The answer is pressure regulators. On E1, we have two pressure regulators directly downstream of the pressure and ball valve. These regulators regulate down from the high source pressure of the pressure and tank down to the safer and more optimal operating pressures of the propellant tanks. In other words, they allow for the more controlled release of high pressure gas into the rest of the system, creating a longer burn at more optimal pressures. The way we decide what pressure the regulators actually regulate to is via the dome port. The dome port is a small volume that's part of the regulator whose pressure determines what pressure the regulators will regulate to. In other words, by setting the pressure of the dome port, we can control what pressure we get in the tanks downstream of the regulators. The way we do this is by branching off of the dome port and connecting a ball valve followed by a quick disconnect or QD. The QDs form the interface between the branch off of the regulator and the external hose that we use to pressurize the dome port. With this GIF, we can see how the QD works. One side is connected to the system and the other side is connected to the external hose. By pulling back on this collar, we can connect and disconnect the hose pretty easily and pressurize the dome port to the desired pressure. Back to the diagram, the way in which we would set the dome port is by first connecting the hose with the QD, opening the ball valve, pressure allowing gas to pressurize the dome port, and then closing the ball valve once the desired pressure is reached. Finally, we can disconnect the QD to remove the hose. At this point, it should be pretty clear that something we care a lot about is the pressure at various different points in the system. For example, when we're setting the dome pressure, how do we know that the dome port has reached the desired pressure and to close the ball valve? The answer is with sensors, more specifically with pressure transducers placed at various different points where we want to know the pressure. Pressure transducers, or PTs for short, are electronic sensors that connect directly to the plumbing of the system and output a voltage that can be interpreted 
as a pressure. In this image of one of the typical PTs that we use, you can see the part on the left is the one that connects directly to the plumbing via these threads at the bottom. And the part on the right, called the PT tail, connects to the part on the left and then outputs a voltage in this green wire that can be read and interpreted as a pressure. One of the main roles of avionics is actually taking these voltage signals and putting them into a form that can be understood to us as humans and recorded as meaningful data. Going back to the diagram, we can see the various points at which we have PTs. Starting at the top, we're reading the pressure of the pressure and tank. Further downstream, we have a PT on the dome volume of the LOX regulator, telling us the pressure of the dome port, and thus the pressure that we will regulate to, approximately. Further downstream, there's a PT on the LOX tree, telling us the pressure of the LOX tank. Similarly, there's a PT on the fuel dome regulator and the fuel tree, telling us the pressures of the fuel dome regulator port and the fuel tank. Further downstream, there are two PTs for each propellant injector input. These tell us the pressures at the injector, which is important for understanding the pressure loss between the tanks and the injector, as well as for determining performance characteristics of the combustion chamber. Speaking of pressure, it's often the case that we want to relieve pressure from the propellant tanks by venting them into the atmosphere. As I mentioned before, the propellant tanks are only rated for around 900 PSI, so it's extremely important to have multiple ways to vent the tanks in the case of an overpressurization event. The main reason for needing to vent the tanks is what's called boil-off. In the case of liquid oxygen, it's a cryogenic fluid, meaning it has an extremely low boiling point of around negative 180 degrees Celsius. This essentially means that it's constantly boiling from the moment we fill it in the tank. And as oxygen transitions from a liquid to a gas, it expands by a factor of around 800, which drastically increases the pressure of the vessel containing it and calls for a venting procedure. Propane, on the other hand, is not a cryogenic fluid, but still has a relatively low boiling point of around negative 40 degrees Celsius. So it's also boiling, but not as fast as LOX, and meaning it's still necessary to be able to vent it even though we don't do it as often. So the first way of venting both propellant tanks is with a manual ball valve, which you see here. So all this really is is a ball valve attached to the fitting tree directly above both propellant tanks that we can open at any time to vent the tank by exposing it to the atmosphere and allowing any extra pressure from the boil off to escape into the surrounding atmosphere, decreasing the pressure of both tanks. The second way of venting the tanks is with a relief valve. So relief valves are a passive way of venting the tanks, meaning they open automatically at a certain pressure, but we don't control when they open. In our case, the, the relief valves relieve pressure at around 750 PSI. So in this GIF, you can see the basic concept behind the relief valve. It's not too complicated. Essentially, there's a spring, and as the volume downstream of the opening gets pressurized, it pushes on the spring until it's exposed to the vent hole, which allows pressure to escape the system. This is what the relief valves that we use look like. These are aqua environment relief valves. And you can see this hole right here is where the fluid escapes once the pressure is strong enough to push this little thing past the beginning of the hole. So yeah, we have two relief valves essentially in the same location as the manual ball valves. And so the third and final way that we use to relieve pressure from the system is these solenoid valves. So solenoid valves actually actuate um, with a current, which means we can open the solenoid valves remotely when no one is near the system. And this is extremely important in the case where we need to vent the system, but no one is close enough to open the ball valves and the pressure is still lower 
than the relief pressure of the relief valves. And so with this diagram, we can see how the solenoid valves work. Essentially, as a current is flowing through a coil, it induces a magnetic field that pulls on this little metal thing that opens and closes the channel. So as the switch opens and closes, the magnetic field is turned on and off, which actuates this little metal thing that either prevents or allows the flow through the channel. Pretty neat. And here's a picture of the GEMS valves that we use. You'll see a few of these on the system. And this hole right here is where the pressure or the fluid escapes from once it's opened. And the coil is contained within this black part. At this point, you might be wondering how we actually fill all three of these tanks. And so the way we do that is pretty similar to the way we fill the dome ports. You can see here there's three QDs for each of the tanks. And this allows us to connect an external hose, which is connected to a source tank somewhere off the system. And with that, we can quickly connect the source tanks and fill the respective tanks on the system. So starting up here, you see there's the pressurant QD, which is located directly upstream of the pressurant ball valve. And there's one QD for each of the propellant tanks. And these are located pretty much as far downstream as they can be for ease of access. And they're directly above the propellant main valves. So looking at this diagram, you'll notice that by filling at this location, we're also filling the lines downstream of the tanks between the bottom of the tanks and the propellant main valves. So while we're filling, the propellant main valves remain closed and we're filling not just the entire volume of the tank, but also the entire volume of the hard line um, downstream of the tanks up to the ball valve. And that's the same thing with the pressurant tank and hard line up here. While we fill it, the pressurant ball valve remains closed and we're filling not just the tank, but also the hard line. So another important component for filling is the check valve. So a check valve is a valve that allows flow in one direction, but not in the other. So as we fill, you'll see that the fluid is allowed to pass through the check valve in this direction, but is not allowed to go back in the other direction. This allows us to fill without letting anything escape. So we can then disconnect the QD and keep the fluids in the tanks. You'll notice there's also another set of check valves directly downstream of each of the regulators. And this is such that, so that, sorry, um, no gas can flow upstream into the regulator from the propellant tanks. If we didn't have these check valves, both gases could potentially make their way up the system and meet, which would be pretty dangerous. So these check valves allow flow past the regulator but don't allow any flow of gas back into the regulator. And here's a quick little diagram of how a check valve works. Pretty straightforward. You can see with this little hatch that flow can go in this direction, but would not be allowed to go in the other direction. And here's a picture of a swage lock check valve that looks pretty similar to the ones we use. Um, and so this is a very sleek solution because it kind of stays in line with the hard line. And on either end here, we would connect some hard line or metal tubing that goes to the rest of the system. And the arrow here indicates which direction the flow is allowed to go in. Okay, cool. So with that, we're almost done. The last component being the capacitive fill level sensors. So unlike the pressure chain seducers, which are commercial off the shelf or COTS components, we actually built and designed the capacitive fill sensors all ourselves. And so the capa these sensors are essentially just long capacitors that go along the entirety of the propellant tanks and whose capacitance can be interpreted as a fill level. So these are useful for knowing the level of the liquids in the tanks as we're filling them, 
and also for determining the flow rates of the propellants out of the tanks during a flow. So just to see how these work, they're essentially just concentric tubes which form the two quote unquote plates of the capacitor. And you can see with this equation that capacitance is a function of the permittivity of the dielectric, which is just a property of the space between the two tubes, the area of the, the plates, and the distance between them. So the area and the distance remain constant. We're not changing any physical properties of the capacitors, but as liquid fills the space between these two um, tubes or rods, the permittivity is changing, right? Because the substance is changing from just atmosphere or gaseous um, propellant to the liquid propellant, which then changes this property and outputs a different capacit capacitance which we can then interpret as a fill level. So there are other sensors on the system other than the capacitive fill sensor and the PTs, but these are the ones that are directly relevant for the plumbing because they connect to um, directly to the plumbing and the tanks. Yeah, so that's all the plumbing. Kudos to you if you made it this far. Make sure you can convince yourself what all the components on this diagram are and kind of why they're important and if you're ever confused about anything, anything comes up, you don't know what it is or what purpose it serves, this is a good diagram to look back on to kind of see the system in simple forms and understand what purpose something serves or what it is. There's also this confluence page um, called Eureka One Plumbing Overview that pretty much goes over the same stuff but in writing and maybe a little bit more detail. So if you want to learn a bit more or see it in writing, um, you can find this confluence page under the general resources. If it's not there, you can just look it up by the title Eureka One Plumbing Overview. And this, this is a good way to kind of go through it a bit slower and read it. Okay, so what I'll do now is walk through the Eureka One CAD, which you can find in Onshape, and kind of go through everything we just talked about, but uh, looking at the actual physical form of the system. So starting at the top, you see we have the pressure tank and downstream of that coming off the pressure tank you see the pressure PT this one's different than the rest because it needs to withstand much higher pressure so this is a 5000 psi PT going downstream you see we have the fill check valve followed by the fill QD so this is where we connect the external fill hose to fill the pressure and then right below that this is the pressurant RBV, and you'll see this is actually, or the pre sorry, the pressurant ball valve. Um, and RBV actually stands for remote ball valve because it's being actuated remotely by this motor. So this motor has a few gears in it that turns the handle of this ball valve so that we can open and close it from a distance. And then going downstream, we have the LOX regulator. So this is the dome regulator. Um, coming off the side right here is the dome port, right? So this is the little vol the dome volume that we pressurize to determine what pressure it's gonna regulate to. And you see here's the, the dome uh, PT, followed by the dome ball valve. And then it turns right here and you have the dome fill QD. So this is the QD that we connect an external hose to to pressurize the dome volume by first opening this ball valve. So coming off uh, the other part of the regulator is so this whole assembly right here is called a LOX fitting tree just because it's right above the LOX tank. And so you see the first thing is the LOX check valve. Um, so this prevents any backflow into the regulator. And then right here we have the LOX um, relief valve that pops at 750 PSI. Um, going down we have the LOX tank PT. So this is reading the pressure of this whole area and the tank. Um, it's, this tells us the pressure of the, the LOX tank. Further down we have the LOX manual vent valve. That's this. You can see it doesn't have a handle on it because it would interfere with things around it. But we have a little key that can open and close it. So this just vents to atmosphere right here uh, when we open and close the vent valve. And then all the way down it goes into the tank. Um, 
yeah, and so all this is all related, or this is the same volume as the LOX tank. And you'll see coming from the center of the tank is the capacitive fill level sensor. That's what this is. Um, this is the top of the sensor, but it goes all the way through through the tank. And then connected to that is the GEMS vent valve. So the GEMS valve actually vents through the capacitive sensor, which you see here, it's connected to the sensor. Um, but that works because the sensor is exposed to the tank inside. And so that's these two. And so you'll see, so there's a T right here. The So the cat is a little bit broken, but this essentially connects to here, right? So this is the part where the pressurant, right after the pressurant RBV, where it tees off to the LOX regulator and the fuel regulator all the way down here. So this would be connected to this tube, which goes all the way down, and this should connect to the fuel regulator. So it's the exact same regulator as the LOX regulator, same type of regulator. Um, you'll see coming off the side here is, this is the dome volume. So here you have the um, the dome PT, which reads the pressure of the dome volume. And then going right here is the dome valve, dome uh, manual valve. And then this is the dome QD. So this is where we set, this is where we connect the external hose to set the, f the fuel um, dome valve or dome volume, uh, which determines what pressure it'll regulate to. So something that I, did, that I didn't mention is that we don't, setting this pressure, the dome pressure, doesn't exactly mean it's gonna regulate to that pressure. And that's a lot of the characterization that we do is uh, kind of characterizing what pressure the regulator will regulate to um, as a function of what we set the dome, um, the dome pressure to. And so that's a topic of another video, but essentially, you just need to know that it's not as simple as you set this to 400 PSI and it'll regulate to 400 PSI. It's a bit more complicated than that. But continuing, you'll see, so coming off the regulator, um, so the flow goes through here, goes through the regulator, comes here. Here's the uh, fuel check valve, which prevents backflow into the fuel regulator. Um, and then you'll see it tees off. You have the fuel relief valve also pops at 750 PSI in the case of overpressurization. And then this is the um, fuel PT, fuel tank PT, which is reading the pressure of this and the fuel tank. Um, and then further down, you have the manual fuel vent valve. Same thing, it's missing the handle, but we can turn the, uh, the valve with a little key and it can vent into the atmosphere that way. And this is the fuel tank. So going further down, this is the bottom of the fuel tank. Um, you'll see, so it gets a bit complicated down here, but um, you'll see down at the bottom here, this is, so these are the, the propellant main valves, and you can see that they're being actuated or they can be turned by these pneumatic pistons. So as this piston op ex or, yeah, expands, or um, yeah, it opens the, the pressure, in, or the, sorry, the propellant main valves by turning this handle, which you can see that mechanism like it right here. Same thing on this side. Um, and so you'll see directly upstream of the uh, main valve is where we actually fill the tanks. So this little extrusion is for filling the tanks. This is the fill check valve. I'm not exactly sure which. I think this is the, the LOX fill by the looks of the QD. Um, so this is the, the check valve followed by the QD. And so this QD is where we connect the external LOX fill hose to. And so you see a similar thing on the one upstream uh, of the other propellant main valve. Right here, it tees off, you have the check valve, and then the fill QD, where we fill the other propellant. And so a lot of this stuff, like these are solenoid valves that help actuate the pneumatic pistons 
um, main valve assembly is pretty complex, so that might be the topic of a different video. But for now, all you need to know is that these pneumatic pistons um, are what in, are in charge of opening and closing these valves, these main valves, um, remotely. So yeah, and then so it's, it gets a bit broken down here. Um, so I won't go too much into detail, but essentially these two PTs are the injector PTs. So the propellants after the main valves are open, they make their way down here to the injector, which is right here. This is the combustion chamber with the injector inside and the nozzle at the bottom. So the propellants make their way into the injector um, and yeah, through these ports, which are, so the CAD's a bit broken right now, but point is these two PTs read the injector pressure um, as the, of the fluid as it goes into the injector yeah so that's pretty much it I um, hope this gives you a better idea of what those symbols look like in real life as you look at this system you'll see a lot of these things there might they might be a bit different for example this relief valve is kind of a placeholder but uh, the general idea is there So yeah, that was the Eureka One plumbing overview. Thank you guys for making it to the end. I really hope you guys learned something new from this video. And as always, please remember to ask any questions at all. Remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So ask any questions, whether it's in the YouTube comment section or on Slack or in person or on Confluence. Just ask any questions. That's the best way to learn. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for more Confluence pages and more videos um, kind of teaching Eureka One and Rocketry in general. And yeah, thank you guys.